So a um, couple of quick things. Uh, revisions to paper one are due on Friday, as you recall, right? So if you want to revise your paper for a better grade, I need that by 11.59 p.m. on Friday, right? Um, I have not reopened the folder yet. I promise I will remember to do so. If you try to resubmit something and can't, let me know so that I'll know that I need to go and fix things. Um, vocab quiz, as per usual, on Sunday. Um, and for Monday, you're going to need to bring both of these books, right? You're going to need to bring volume E and volume F with you. Because we're, do, um, we're going to be splitting the reading between the two volumes. Right? So you've got these uh, Victorian texts, you know, the Proclamation of the Irish Republic and Matthew Arnold's on the study of Celtic literature, plus some Yeats poems that are technically still Victorian, but because all the Yeats stuff is in the 20th century volume, that's just where they put it, right? So just remember that you need both books for next time. Uh, the other thing that I do want to note is that people should be thinking about paper topics. Um, a couple of you have already um, run some ideas by me. Um, that's good. Um, they've been good ideas. Um, but remember that when you have the annotated bibliography is due the 22nd, right? So you got a couple of weeks for that. But remember that the research is going to take a little bit of time as well. So it's probably a good idea if you at least know what you want to write on and have been able to get some sources together, or at least order some sources, by the end of next week. So, you know, I, I just, I, I say this just to keep everyone thinking ahead here, right? Um, so I'm happy to help you with your research if you need it. I'm happy to loan people books if it helps, right? Um, but it's, it is about time to get this underway. Um, so yeah, please start, start thinking about this. And, I'm happy to talk through ideas with you as well. So does anybody have any questions about anything? We're good? Right. Then let's talk about what the hell happened to the eraser? Every time we come into this room, something's weird. What was it doing over here? OK. So <clears throat> you two were indicating as you came into class that you really going to dug this poem, right? Mm -hmm. What did you like about it? What did you find interesting about this? I like that the goblins attacked Lizzie. <laughs> like, I just thought it, it made an interesting story. Okay. Like okay. It, she ate the fruit, she went crazy, and then the, the sister tried to go back and help her, and they attacked her because uh -huh. she wanted to it, and then yeah. I, but I, yeah, but I, I think yeah, that there's an interesting contrast here too between the reactions to the two sisters, right? So let's first look at what happens when Laura goes to feast with the goblins, right? And then we'll compare it to what happens when Lizzie goes to get the fruits. And you know, we'll maybe kind of like build our interpretation of this around this, right? So can I get somebody to start reading for or reading for us on page 544 from but sweet tooth sweet tooth Laura spoke in haste. But Line 115. Oh thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. But sweet tooth Laura spoke in haste. Good folk, I have no coin. To take word to purloin, I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either. And all my go gold is on the furs that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. You have much gold upon your head, they answered all together. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl. Okay, let's pause there for a second, right? We'll start with the purchase, right? So what does she use to purchase the fruits? Okay. Yeah. Right? A lock of golden hair, right? You have much gold upon your head. All right, so we'll just make a note of that and then continue. She dropped a tear more red than pearl, then sucks their fruit gloves fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man rejoicing wine, clearer than water flowed that juice. She never tasted such before. 
How should it cloy with length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked the more, fruits which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the empty brines away, but gathered up on Colonel Stone, and knew not it was was it night or day, and she was turned home alone. Okay, so how do you read the rest of this? Or how do you read Laura's consumption of the fruit here? Is there anything about this that seems strange to you? Okay, yeah, there's a total lack of restraint here, right? Yeah, she just goes whole hog on these fruits, right? What else? Like, are there any, like, like repeated words or anything like that that seem telling to you? What's well, that she sucked? Like, she didn't just, like, bite it. She sucked. Yeah. Is she eating these fruits alone? Is she by herself when this is happening? Well, she's with the goblins, but they're yeah. with her. And this is yeah, this is, this is kind of like the goblin stipulation, right? Right, like we want you to stay here and party with us, right? Don't take these fruits home, right? We're gonna give them to you here. Is there anything else that seems odd to you? Well, she took uh, back the, like, the seed. Yeah, she takes this kernel stone, right? And that's going to be important as well. All right, so let's compare this then to her sister's experience. Can I get somebody to read on page 550, starting around line 363, with uh, Good Folks Said Lizzie? Good Folks Said Lizzie, mindful of gaining, giving me much and many, held out her apron, tossed down her penny. Nay, take a seat with us, honor and eat with us, they answered grinning. Our feast is but beginning. Night yet is early, warm and dew early. Wakeful and starry, such fruits as these no man can carry. Half their bloom would fly, half their dew would dry, half their flavor would pass by. Sit down and feast with us, be welcome guests with us. Cheer you and rest with us. Thank you, said Lizzie, but one way to come alone for me. So without further parley, if you want to sell me any of your fruits, for much and many, give me back my silver penny and I'll toss you for a fee. Okay, so let's pause here and start the comparison, right? So what does Lizzie try to pay with? Silver silver penny, right? So she tries to pay with actual money, not with a lock of her hair, right? So let's maybe think about the significance of this. Right? What do the goblins want from these girls? It's like, what, what happens when Walt Lizzie tries to give them the silver penny? They don't want that, right? Yeah, they won't sell her any fruit. There's another difference noted here as well. What else do the goblins want from Lizzie? Yeah, again, like yeah, they, they want her to sit and party with them like her sister did, right? But she rejects their company, right? She rejects their advances. So what's the difference here between offering up a silver penny and offering up a lock of golden hair? It's almost like with the hair, like they can like remember her. They can like look at the hair and like, oh, it's Laura. Okay, and it, it, it is, yeah, it, it's, they're asking of something specific from Laura, right? But what's, we, like, if they want a remembrance of her, then what's weird about what happens after she parties with the goblins? Yeah, Laura never sees them again, right? So there's got to be something else going on here, right? You know, rather than maybe like a remembrance, 
And maybe we can, if we think back to the moral and mortal and some of the discourse around beauty in that story, we might find a connection there, right? Let's remember here, like, I think we talked a little bit about this last time as well, right? What was the source of Bertha's power over Whimsy? Yeah, her beauty was what made her desirable in the marriage market, right? So her beauty was basically her means of exchange, right? I give you my beauty, and you give me, a, you know, a, a place to live and, uh, you know, a heart to care for and all that sort of thing, right? And I think there's a similar thing going on here, right? That's what the goblins want from Laura, because what happens to her then after she can't get the fruits anymore? Yeah, let's actually, let, let's uh, take a minute and go <clears throat> to see uh, what, what her, uh, what she, what she, you know, eventually looks like. Um, let's see. Right, page 548, right? Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain, in sullen silence of exceeding pain. She never caught again the goblin cry, come by, come by. She never spied the goblin men, hawking their fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and gray. She dwindled as the fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. So yeah, her beauty and her youth fade after she's given this lock of golden hair to the goblins. And then what happens when she tries to plant the kernel stone that they gave her? Yeah, nothing happens, right? She tries to plant it, right? One day, remembering her kernel stone, she set it by a wall that faced the south, dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot, but there came none. It never saw the sun. It never felt the trickling moisture run. While with sunk eyes and faded mouth, she dreamed of melons, as a traveler sees false waves and desert drought. With shade of leaf-crowned trees, and burns the thirstier in the sandful breeze. So think about the like droughts, deserts, a kernel stone that doesn't grow, a seed that doesn't that doesn't grow, right? What do all of these things suggest together? Okay, yeah, oh, kind of withering away, right? She was she was young and beautiful before she ate the fruit, right? And it seems, in fact, that eating the fruits had taken away that youth. It might help if we look at what happens to, like, the description of what happened to their friend Jeannie, who also ate the goblin fruits, right? Page 549. Can I get somebody to read for us, uh, sorry, what she thought of Jeannie in her grave? Thank you. So let's think of a genie who should have been a bride, who for joys brides hope to have fell sick and died. What's this suggest? And especially if we kind of think about the demand that the uh, from the goblins that the girls stick around and hang out with them. What's this maybe starting to look a little bit? What do these joys brides hope to have? It's almost like like them getting in getting into their temptation costs them like their life. Yeah, yeah, it seems like like a kind of sexual temptation, right? For one thing, who are the only men we see in the novel? Goblin. Yeah, the goblins are the only male characters, right? And 
if we go to the very first line of the poem, or the very first couplet here, right? Morning and evening, maids heard the goblins cry, come by our orchard fruits, come by, come by. So who is it that hears the goblins? Who are the goblins shouting to? The maids. Maids, yeah, and I think if we think, think here of maid as a contraction of maiden, right? So who are the goblins calling out to? To women, specifically to young virginal women, right? And so if we're thinking along these lines, the kernel stone takes on um, a larger significance, right, the kind of discourse of infertility. Right, Laura's little romp with the goblins produces momentary pleasure but nothing else. And then afterwards, she fades away and is abandoned, right? Now, can we relate this to any of the Victorian gender discourses we talked about last time? Give this a minute. Think about it. Yeah, go. Oh, you have you have some Jordan? The Great Social Evil. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Why 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 would you connect this to the Great Social Evil? Because she talks about the lost virtue. Okay. That stems in the prostitution. Yeah. Like a fallen woman we talked about. Sure. Although that author's um, basic argument is the fallen woman doesn't really exist, right? That no prostitutes don't fall out of the middle class they rise up from the working class. And um, if we didn't really get to this, but it might help if we actually, I want to give you all some kind of facts and figures um, about uh, Victorian prostitution and Victorian working class women more generally, right? So for one thing, we noted kind of what the life of a middle class woman was typically like, right? What was a middle? What, what was kind of the the, the, expect, the expectation of life for a middle class woman? What were you going to do? Yeah, tend to the home, right? By which again we mean manage the home, right? You're not actually doing housework. Your servants do that. You just manage the household servants, um, you know, so your husband can go out and just do whatever he does in the outside world. So, by and large, in the working classes. Right, women worked both inside and outside the home, right? Not only did they keep the house, they were also expected to go out and earn a wage, right? Everybody in the family, including the children, went out and earned a wage. This was actually one reason why, um, you know, when people when um, middle class politicians proposed reform to child labor laws, the strongest resistance often came from families who had children working because those laws often didn't include provisions that would raise wages for the parents, right? They would just stop the children working and then reduce the family's income. So, <clears throat> A lot, though by no means a majority, of working class women, particularly in large cities, because they were paid very little, right, considerably less than men for the same jobs, um, often supplemented their income with prostitution, particularly widows. This was very common with widows who had children to support. Right. If there was no longer, you know, a, you know, an adult male in the house bringing in an income, 
the family had to get money from somewhere. So from 1840 to 1890, um, there were estimated uh, and between 25 and 30,000 prostitutes working in England and Wales. And middle class reformers tended to approach this as a moral or a public health problem rather than as an economic problem, right? And I think that Rossetti is coming at this from a slightly different angle if we look at the way Laura and Lizzie behave together. Right? For one thing, there does seem to be some um, acknowledgement here of the kind of fallen woman myth, right? right? A woman who has fallen out of the, of the middle class through sexual impropriety, and thus, what, what were you? What were what were other respectable middle class women supposed to do when one of their sisters fell? How were they supposed to treat her if they're following the rules of polite society? supposed to be shunned, right? She's not welcome in decent homes anymore. You know, I showed you that series of portraits, you know, the, one, the girl kicked out of the house and then forced to wander the streets, who then ends up dead on the Thames Embankment, right? So that's, you know, sort of considered, you know, the, the wages of sexual sin here, right? That the fallen woman is never to be reintegrated into society. Her angel in the house sisters are supposed to kind of close ranks against her. And yet, like, what do we see Lizzie doing even before she tries to rescue Laura? Remember what we just said about, um, you know, their friend Jeannie a moment ago in her grave, right? The first girl to go off and uh, mess with the goblins. Who takes care of Jeannie's grave? Who visits her? Who tends it? Yeah, Lizzie planted daisies there that won't grow, right? But yeah, it's clear that she does go and visit, you know, remembers Jeannie and treasures that memory, right? So even though Lizzie is, you know, quote unquote, the good sister in this pairing, right? She has pity, she has sympathy for those who have fallen to temptation and works to, at the very least, preserve Jeannie's memory here, right? So let's look at what happens to Lizzie when she rejects the goblin's offer. Uh, we go back to page 550. Jordan, can you finish reading from They Begin to Scratch Their Pates? They Begin to Scratch Their Pates. Lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with their nails, barking, mewing, kissing, and walking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, switched, twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make free. Okay, thank you. So, have the goblins been obviously threatening?
You're shaking your head. Pardon? I was just saying that obviously are overburdened. Yeah, I mean, what what are the goblins? What are we told the goblins look like early in the poem? Yeah, they look like animals, right? One has a face like a cat. One is like a parrot. One is like a snail. You know, one is like this kind of you know badger kind of thing, like kind of capering back and forth, right? So you know, they're they're cute, right? They're cute little fuzzy things. They're not threatening. They're just cute little fuzzy things, uh, you know, carrying around plates of fruit, right? Crying, come by, come by. And then once Lizzie says she's not going to hang out with them, things turn nasty, right? And what what is what is this particular? What does this kind of look a little bit like? What kind of situation arises here when she asks for her penny back and makes to leave? Is that like beating her up to try to force her to eat? Yeah, it becomes very much the the tearing of the dress and the forcing her to eat the fruit. Right? It starts with verbal abuse. Right? You know, you know, like, like you know, um, you know, what kind of situation where, like, you know, if if you turn, like, if a guy asks you out, you turn him down, right? You know, and he blames you for it, right? Because oh, well, she's stuck up or whatever. Um, and then it turns violent, tearing the dress, forcing her to eat the fruits, right? So yeah, they're, she is assaulted by the goblins. <clears throat> Right, we go a little further down here. Right? One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink. Though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her. Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip, lest they should cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syruped all her face and lodged in dimples of her chin, and streaked her neck which quaked like a curb. At last the evil people Worn out by her resistance, flung back her penny, kicked their fruit, along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed into the ground, some dived into the brook. With ring and ripple, some scudded on the gale that a sound, some vanished in the distance. So Lizzie does not give in to their assault, right? But she ends up covered in the juices of the fruits, right? And this is what she brings back to her sister to try to revive her, right? So <clears throat> we'll come back to this in a minute because you know, like, this is like one of the kind of weirdnesses of the poem, right? But I think one thing that I kind of want to point to, like especially like kind of given that the goblins are initially kind of presented as cute, and the kind of simple sing-songy rhythm and basic rhyme scheme of the poem. Who does it kind of sound like this is written for? Children. Okay, yeah. What 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 kind of what makes this seem like a children's story? Because they say, like, like it's like a sing-song usually. Like nursery rhymes and stuff like that are very like. Yeah, very simple meters, very simple, regular rhymes, right? Um, and nursery rhymes often also do have a kind of darker undercurrent if you look below the surface, right? In part because they emerge out of folk tradition and were not originally intended for children. So in fact, in 1859, when this poem was first published, the idea of childhood as a separate stage of human development is actually pretty new. For most of human history, in most societies, children have largely simply been treated as adults in training. Right, the idea that there's anything special or different about children apart from them being smaller and 
and less experienced than adults, right, is something that really only comes into being in the 19th century and starts with children of the upper classes, right? And I think this is another, like, please do not anyone think that I'm arguing that child labor laws should be repealed, right? And that little kids should be working in coal mines again, right? No, right? But I think one reason why we need to, you know, like, it, it's hard for us to look back on that sort of thing and accept it, right? Like, and think about how could people morally allow this because we don't look at children the same way they did. Right? Two, for example, you know, a working class family in Birmingham, right? A child was on the one hand another mouth to feed, but also another pair of hands that could be earning a living. So the idea that children are different from adults in some significant way really only emerges in the Victorian period and starts with the upper and the upper middle classes. And so we see this kind of explosion of interest in fairy tales. Now the fairy tale we, as we know it actually emerges at the end of the 17th century in France. Have any of you ever heard the name Charles Perrault before? Okay, you may not have heard the name, but you, have, you are probably familiar with his work. Cinderella, Puss in Boots, Sleeping Beauty, Bluebeard. Maybe not Bluebeard. Bluebeard's a little bit less familiar because it's pretty not appropriate for children, like at all. I mean, murdered wives in a cellar and things like that. It's, <laughs> it's pretty damn dark. But yeah, so Perrault takes you know these you know these friend, these European folk tales. And you know, kind of makes them into kind of modern fantasy short stories, not for children. He's not writing for children, but for an adult audience. And over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, people like Perrault and the Brothers Grimm and Antoine Galland who produces the first European translations of the Thousand and One Nights. Um, their work is appearing in England in inexpensive translations, often with violent and sexual content toned down, primarily for a kind of nursery audience. Right. Specifically, kind of to be given to children. So, <clears throat> there is a kind of sense of that kind of audience in Goblin Market as well, right? Especially given that we have a little moral lesson at the end. Let's actually take a quick look at that. Can I get some, one of you to start reading for us on page 553, um, from around line 40, 543, days, weeks, months, years. Days, weeks, months, years, afterwards when both their wives with children of their own, their mother hearts the set with years, their lives smelled up in tender lives, or would call the little ones and tell them of her early crime. Those pleasant days long gone of not returning time. We talk about the haunted glen, the wicked quaint, fruit merchant men, their fruits like honey to the throat, but poison in the blood. Men sell not such in any town. We tell them how her sister stood in deadly peril to do her good, and win the fiery antidote, in joining hands to little hands, would bid them cling together, for there is no friend like a sister in calmer stormy weather, to cheer one on the tedious way, to fetch one if one goes astray, to lift one if one powders down, to strengthen whilst one stands. Okay, so what, what, do you, what do you make of this little 
this little moral thing. Like, what's going on in this last first, para first paragraph? What are we getting a glimpse of? Prolepsis, right? We're fast forwarding now into the future. And yeah, there is a kind of like cautionary moral attachment. Right? So this is unusual in terms of a lot of the things that we've read in that there, there is an explicit moral state, right? And we tend to associate stories that have an explicit moral or an explicit lesson with writing for children as well, right? It's something we tend not to see in writing that is intended for adults. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner kind of has a moral, but it's sort of muddled and the poem itself undercuts it a lot, right? In fact, I think there are actually a lot of similarities between this and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, uh, but we'll maybe get into some of that if you not quite where I was going with this. Um, so yeah, we've got this explicit cautionary moral. And what's is there anything that you find kind of interesting or unusual about this moral about or about this last verse paragraph in general? Let me put it to you this way: like who who or what is still completely absent from the end of the Yeah, who were they married to, right? They're both wives. Who were their husbands, right? Mr. Laura and Mr. Lizzie don't appear. And what else is then kind of suggested about their ch about the children? That they're all girls. Yeah, that the children are all girls, right? There's no friend like a sister. So let's try to tie this back to that fallen woman trope again, right? Again, like if you're a respectable middle class woman, what are you supposed to do with the fallen woman? Shun. Shun. Shun, right? Far away. Stay far away. But what's the basic argument of the poem here then regarding how women should treat each other? Is this an argument in favor of shunning? women who have committed some kind of sexual crime. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, what, what's basically happened here with Laura? It's not like she's forgiven by Lizzie. Not forgiven, but like, Liz, she doesn't hold it against her the rest of her life. Yeah, and, what, and we, we see that Laura's life trajectory after this event is a normal Victorian woman, middle class woman's life trajectory, right? She's now married with children and she's telling the story to her children. So she's been reintegrated into society, right? Something that's supposed to be impossible for the fallen woman because other women aren't supposed to associate with her, right? So if we extend this, if we extend this out logically, right, who is Rossetti suggesting is most responsible for what happens to women who fall out of respectable society? Uh, is it men who are most responsible for what happens to women who fall out of respectable society? Outside of her, that are being judgmental towards that woman. Yes, exactly. What she's arguing is that the you know the so-called fallen woman can actually be reclaimed and reintegrated, right? If people won't be such goddamn snobs, 
right, if other women put aside their prejudices and are willing to help lift her back up, she can become as they are, right? Now, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, we can, you know, we can consider, right? But the basic idea here is that it's on women to support other women and to lift them back up when they fall, right? And I think that this is actually like, we can tie this back to what we're told about Laura and Lizzie's farm work here, right? Can we go back to page 546? Can I get somebody to read from early in the morning when the first cock crowed his warning? Early in the morning, the first cock crowed his warning. Meat like these, as sweet and busy. Now are we going to the Thank you. So, how do Laura and Lizzie typically spend their days? What do they do? Chores. They do chores, yeah. And what do most of these chores amount to? Mm -hmm. What's that? To feeding their family. Yeah, they're providing their own nourishment, right? They're making cakes. They're churning butter, right? They're, you know, Milking the cows, they're you know they, apparently they, they keep bees too. They're fetching in honey, right? So they have a little farm, and do they actually need the goblin spruits? Yeah, what do we know? Like, do they actually need any help from anyone? Yeah, we've got a picture here of a little self-sustaining, self-sufficient operation, right? As long as the sisters are working together, they can produce everything they need themselves. So the goblin fruits, which have to be bought, are a kind of imposition into this self-contained self-sufficient world, right? And let's look at the list of fruits. That the goblins sell. Page 542. Can I get somebody to start reading from us for, for us from morning and evening maids heard the goblins cry? Morning and evening maids heard the goblins cry. Come buy our orchard fruits, come buy, come buy. Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plums, unpacked cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down cheeks, peaches, swart headed mulberries, wild freeborn cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples. Blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather. Morns that pass by, fair eats that fly, can buy, can buy. Our grapes fresh from the vine, pomegranates full and fine, dates and sharp bullets, rare pears and green, green gauges, mm -hmm. damsons and bilberries, chase them and try, currants and gooseberries, bright fire like barberries, mixed to fill your mouth, citrons from the mm -hmm. south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, can buy, can buy. So what this is based on is kind of actual street sellers pitches uh, from 19th century England, right? So, you know, a fruit merchant, like, you wouldn't, like, go to the grocery store to buy fruit. Like, such a place typically didn't really exist, right? Like, about kind of, like, general grocery. Instead, you would often, like, you would visit market stalls or there would be sellers walking up and down your street who would have a pitch um, usually like a catchy little jingle to try to attract your attention so you can come buy from them. And that's kind of what the goblins are doing here, right? So they, it's, it's an imitation of the 
Victorian market behavior. What else do we notice about the fruits that they have on offer? For one thing, they say, come buy our orchard fruits. What's an orchard? controlled conditions. Yeah, so an orchard implies a kind of artificiality, right? That this is fruit that is in some way being shaped by the hand of, by, the, by human hands, rather than simply allowed to grow wild and natural, right? right? An orchard and a forest are not the same thing. And what about the list of fruits here on offer? So I'm guessing, for one thing, that some of these are probably unfamiliar to you, right? But even among some of the ones that you might have heard of before, you know, so, you know pomegranates, uh, citrons, right? Do all of these fruits actually grow in England? Yeah, you, can't, you definitely cannot grow a pomegranate in England, right? That's not... Um, except, except maybe in a, you know, in a greenhouse, right? But yeah, they serve, a lot of these fruits do not grow wild in England. So not only are these artificial imported, uh, like, like artificial, um, artificially grown fruits in some sense, they're also, in many cases, fruits that would have to be imported. So there's a kind of suspicion here as well of foreign goods. Right, you have the wholesome food that <clears throat> Laura and Lizzie make through their own industry. And then you have these much more suspect fruits that these goblins are hawking across the river, right? In fact, if you look on page 543, right? Laura says, we must not look at goblin men, we must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Let's look at those two lines there. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Given what we've been talking about just now, like what's the anxiety that's expressed here? Okay, yeah. If, yeah, if we replace, yeah, if, if we kind of think of that in terms of the sexual discourses that we were talking about earlier, absolutely, right? Who knows what they might be carrying? Mm -hmm. Right? Goblin Market over there could also be Syphilis City. But even if we're just thinking about this in terms of, even if we're just thinking of the fruit as fruit, right? Compared to Laura and Lizzie's own food, right? We know exactly where it comes from and how it's produced, right? How are the goblin's fruits then different? If who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? What's suspect or scary about the goblin's fruit as fruit? Yeah, you don't know where it, you don't know where it comes from, right? And I think that there's an anxiety here expressed about colonial trading practices, right? Right. It's in the 19th century as the empire expands. You've got all of these goods flowing into England from South Asia, from China, 
from Australia, from Africa, from the Caribbean, right? Many of them luxury goods. And all of them obtained by kind of suspect imperialist and business practices, right? So I think there is also kind of implied criticism here of colonial trade practices. Um, and that like everything the goblins provide is just kind of extra and unnecessary, right? These are things that people don't need. They're not produced by native industry. And they are, you know, the goblins are also, as we see, kind of exploiters of women, right? So why would they not also be exploiters of whatever farmers grow their fruits, right? And I want to try to take us back to the beginning here and Laura's silver penny. Lizzie's silver penny, sorry. Laura pays with a lot of hair, Lizzie pays with a silver penny. And we already noted, right, they don't take the silver penny, right? They take Laura's lock of hair, they don't take Lizzie's silver penny. So how are these two objects kind of different from each other in kind? What's the difference between a silver penny and a lock of golden hair? Okay, yeah, this is, yeah, Laura's, Laura's uh, currency is unique, right? Yeah, it's impersonal, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah, she tries to pay with something impersonal, right? But why does Laura pay with a lock of her gold? Why does she, why does she offer up the hair in the first place? She doesn't have any money, yeah. Do Laura and Lizzie actually need money? No. Their farm produces everything they need, right? So they have no particular use for a market. So when Lizzie shows up with a silver penny, she's trying to participate in the more masculine world of commerce, right? If we think again about kind of these gender divisions between hearth and home, which was the woman's sphere, and the public world of the market and of politics, which was the man's sphere, right? Bringing the silver penny is an attempt to negotiate with the goblins on what she perceives as their own terms, right? Their own impersonal terms. And yet that's not what they want from her. They want her in a subordinate position. They, want, they don't want to deal with her as an equal. And so they refuse the silver pain. So we've kind of unpacked a lot of stuff from what looks like a really, really simple poem on the surface, right? So I want to show you quickly before we go um, some illustrations from the first edition of this. And I just kind of want to see what you make of these. So the, uh, Christina Rossetti came from a well-known literary and artistic family. Uh, her older brother, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, was a well-known poet and painter. And he was one of the, lead, uh, the leading members of a group called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And the Pre-Raphaelites in the mid-19th century uh, were a group of um, painters who kind of rejected 
the idea that they should be painting the world as they knew it was supposed to be, and instead preferred to paint the world as they saw it. Um, so they kind of shied away from idealism in painting towards a kind of realism, but it's a very kind of literary realism. Um, you know, they tended to paint uh, you know, so, you know, literary scenes, um, often from the Middle Ages or the ancient world. And so, yeah, Dante Gabriel Rossetti did drawings for his sister's book of poems. And I want to show you all the ones that were specific, that specifically referenced Goblin Mark. Dante Gabriel was also kind of, kind, of a, kind of a weird and interesting human. Um, when his first wife died, he buried the manuscript of his poems with her, and then a couple, a couple of years later thought better of it and dug them back up again. So that's fun. So these are the two illustrations that he provided for this poem. And uh, which, what scenes? Did he choose to illustrate here? The sisters sleeping together after uh, Laura got back from the group. Uh huh. Laura eating the group. Yeah. Problems. And what do we notice here about Laura's dream? She's dreaming of the, like the goblins with their feet. Yeah, and it, it, it's almost like a little thought bubble from like a Garfield comic or something, right? And but it's it's also shaped like a full moon. I think that you know that this is okay. One one thing that we didn't really have time to tease out of this was the distinction that's made between kind of daytime and moonlight here, right? That nighttime seems to be associated with these kind of illicit activities and groups like the goblins, whereas daytime, you know, early morning is associated with the productive world of work and chores and things of that nature. Now, what's the other scene that's been illustrated here? Yeah, with Laura cutting her hair to pay for the fruit, we see Lizzie running away behind, right? And all of the cute furry little goblins offering up their fruits to us. See, look, yeah, it's a cute little mouse man, right? You know, it's <laughs> not threatening at all. So yeah, so we, yeah, we have here the, the, ex the initial exchange and then the aftermath of it, right? So I don't want to belabor this because we are about out of time. I just wanted to show this to you. Um, let me give you the reading questions for next time. See you all on Monday.